Let's go. Yep. Okay. Yep. You're good. You're good. Okay. See. What's going on, everybody? Gunner here. Um, and, and today's going to be a little bit different. I basically want to do kind of a blog. Um, and this is obviously a few months later, but I, I want to talk about my trip uh, down to Brazil with nomadic water, share a bunch of pictures, maybe have some a uh, few little video clips just about the fishing and flies and um, just a few cool things that I caught on film. And I am outside because it's like 50 degrees in March in Duluth, which is like t-shirt weather, and I'm loving it. So we're going to film this whole thing out here, and you're going to have to bear with me. Um, so first and foremost, uh, Nomadic Waters is an, an outfitter that I did a, a large-scale commercial order for, and that's, that's who um, I designed the Glidefly for, based off of their recommendations, kind of the color combos for the watersheds, you know, the length of flies that they need for their peacock bass. Um, and I had sent the owner, Michael, down with imposters the year before, and about a perchy color, which is kind of like a really aggressive fire tiger kind of you know, juvenile peacock bass looking thing, and they devoured it. And um, we just kind of brought up some durability and how to make the most durable fly. So I brought up tube flies, and man, that has been a long rabbit trail ever since then. Um, but it's been fun to share some of that stuff with you guys. So that's what that fly was designed for, it was actually Brazil. So if any of you guys are considering a trip like this, you probably have some questions. Like, you know, I'm like, let's go to Brazil and chase some peacock bass and my life, wife is like well, wait a minute <laughs> like do you need any vaccines like is it safe like who are you staying with how does this whole thing work right so uh, basically I didn't there's a few recommend uh, recommended vaccines and stuff you can get I didn't do anything I came back just fine um, but the basically nomadic waters they send you like an email once a month that has a whole list of stuff that you got to do reminders refreshers stuff you know packing suggestions it goes over all the gear that you need of course I facilitate some of this stuff because I'm going to tell you guys what rods and lines and stuff I used right but they have emails that take care of all this stuff and reminders but basically you need you know a valid passport driver's license that stuff and then a Brazilian visa which is pretty easy to get and you can just do it online now it doesn't take too too long um, and aside from that no no vaccines or anything like that and the moment you book your plane ticket which I used nomadic waters to have like a little a travel agent that kind of booked the group for us so that we're all we have some clout if there's some issues because we're all traveling together if that makes sense um, but they did a really good job of making it just totally stress-free and the moment you land in Brazil there's somebody from Nomadic Waters that picks you up. Like, somebody meets you there. The moment you get your bags, somebody from Nomadic Waters is there. So you're never just like wandering about, like, do we get a taxi? Like, where's this hotel? And they got a private uh, van that they rent. They take you to the hotel, they check you in, they pick you up the next morning. We act ended up taking a, a charter plane farther downstream to a small town, and that's where we met up with the houseboat. And, and that's some of the stuff that I want to get to is like, you stay on a houseboat, so you're not like in the jungle somewhere, but you're actually on this like 80 foot yacht or 100, I don't know how big it was, it was huge, three stories, the whole top deck is wide open with hammocks strung all over the place, you go up there and smoke cigars and drink beer afterwards and tell fish stories during lunch and stuff, it was really cool. Um, and so like, you know, your rooms, like one of the things I was always, you know, it's just like, it's hot, right? It's probably, I don't know if they ever measure it, but it's probably at least 100 degrees every day. Um, and so it's just hot and sunny every day with 100% humidity. If you ever bring a GoPro or camera gear or something, never bring it into your room, which is air conditioned. <laughs> don't ever bring it in your room. Leave it outside all night long. I just left my stuff on the top deck outside and I have a little travel box because if you bring it in and then take it out, it'll fog for like three hours trying to adjust to the humidity differences and the temperature differences. Leave it out. The whole time you're down there, just leave it outside. You'll be able to film everything, no problem. Just wanted to add that. 
but yeah, basically the rooms have AC. There was, uh, you know, the rooms are single occupancy, so you're not sharing with anybody, you know, and they're like single bunk beds, which is cool because you put all your gear and stuff and organize everything on top, which was super useful for me because I brought all my fly tying stuff to film those tutorials. So that was extremely helpful. <laughs> um, each room had its own bathroom, right? And, and this is all dependent on the yacht they get. And I, th I think in years past, it's kind of been a different boat each year, but it's always been upgrading. So this year it was, it was a really nice boat. And there was a cool kind of like group room in the back where we could all hang out afterwards and tell fish stories. And there was a fridge fully stocked with Brazilian beer, which in 100 degree weather, I'm kind of an IPA guy, but when it's been 100 degrees all day, you can't beat a pilsner. You just, it's the most refreshing thing on the planet when you've been sweating for 12 hours straight to crack a cold one. <laughs> so you'd hang out with everybody in this air conditioned room. They bring you appetizers and stuff. The food is unreal. It's, it's all, I mean, they got Brazilians cooking in the kitchen. It's some of the coolest stuff. And one of the cool things is the people on the boat, like I, there's, you know, house cleaner, there's onboard laundry. So like I packed, you know, like two pairs of pants. I, I wore pants, I, I don't like sunscreen. Two pairs of pants, two long sleeve shirts, and that was it. And they do laundry every day. You just leave your clothes in your room, they'd wash them and put them back. <laughs> so, you know, you're not bringing down like a week's worth of clothes, which is really nice because saves room for fishing gear. But anyway, the crew that are on the boat, well, they fish for piranha during the day. And so like every other day, we'd have piranha for dinner or piranha appetizers. It's like, it's um, you know, it's like bluegill or crappies. Like it's pan fried amazingness. So we had a lot of fish. Um, there was an afternoon where it's in the intro to a lot of my, my uh, the fly time, the beginner predator fly series, those fish on that open, on that open fire. We went to a small village um, that was way up, way up the Uatama. So basically, ah, uh, man, I'm so scatterbrained. But you get on this houseboat, and we motored throughout the whole night. So you're on the Amazon River, right? And we're downstream of the Rio Negro confluence, and there's a massive tributary that's about the size of the Mississippi. And I think the statistics are, it's like the Amazon's like 11 Mississippis or nine Mississippis, like a massive watershed. Hard to imagine the scale of it, but it's literally like, miles of cross at some locations. <laughs> so we meet up this tributary and we motor up through the night and the crew's using spotlights and stuff and finding the shoreline and navigating this and they have all the, the sandbars change every year but they, they know where they are this year because they have to learn them, I would assume. <laughs> I don't know how that works. And we motored through that night, probably my guess would be about 70 miles. I don't, maybe 60 miles because we dropped down about 10 miles a day. Oh, it was pretty close to that, maybe eight, seven, eight. And so what you do then is this houseboat is towing bass trackers, literally like 16 foot aluminum bass trackers, which is amazing from a fly fisherman's point of view because you have casting decks, a place for your line to fall, and you're not, you know, uh, in a John boat somewhere uh, standing on these benches trying not to have crap all over the floor, but you're on this super nice flat casting deck bass tracker in the middle of the Amazon rainforest, which is really really cool and so you basically the houseboat stationed and you'd everyone would jump in the bass trackers there's always two guys and one guide so two customers and a guide and there's gear fishing and fly fishing but it's i would say it was probably 80 percent fly guys and we'd motor upstream miles you know three four miles sometimes some one day we went up to a waterfall it's like a 15 mile run and we'd motor upstream but you, you didn't really fish the river channel very often you'd push through these little back eddies to these massive flooded lake lagoon type things and it's all still water fishing for the most part and i would warn people it's um i mean you get you pick it up quick the whole i struggled with strip setting so bad and make you know you'd make a 60 foot cast and he'd eat it a foot from the bank and you'd trout set it's like you didn't have a hope of catching that fish <laughs> But truly, either still water guys or saltwater fishermen who are probably used to fishing like mangroves and stuff are really going to pick it up that first day. Everybody else kind of, you struggle, you see a lot of big fish, you might, someone might get lucky those first two days or so and then the third day you start to fall into that, I got this figured out, I got the tension right in my hands, I'm stick a pig with my line hand, stick them with your line hand. So these lagoons, massive. Some are small, some are medium, some are big. But we'd fish different ones each day, and, and I think we, we ran five boats. I think they tow six, and we ran five. So we had like 10 guests a week. And so 
different guides would fish different areas. Some would fish the main river. You'd fish where the lagoon and the main river came, came together. You'd fish the opposite side where the lake and that little channel came together. You'd fish the whole lake in still water. There's a few like really cool like sandbars and stuff in the main river channel that we fish. So I mean, you fish all over. And what's cool is I mentioned we drop down like 10, 8, 7 miles every day. And so you never fish the same stuff twice. And you never fish with the same guide twice. Or you might, I think I fished with Rodrigo twice. But, you, you, I mean, you're changing guides, and, and each guide fishes a little differently, and they all, some are, you know, looking for that 20 pounder, and, and some are looking for numbers, and, and some are, I mean, they're just, it's really cool, because they all work the structure a little different, some pick different structure, and, and they all fish. And this was something that I, I found super interesting, but they all fish, but they're not trying to catch fish. And what they do is they actually throw a topwater plug, um, a chopper it's called the chopper and it's a it's got a big wooden plug like 12 inch plug with a massive prop on the back so they pitch this thing and you look i mean they're trying to move a fish and they're trying to bring fish into structure because that's what happens peacock bass are like muskies or basically it's kind of like saltwater fish when they hear bait fish like freaking out and getting eaten like it just collects more and more fish so they're trying to make a disturbance and it draws fish to that area so you fish like a high percentage structure like a wooded point or a big sandbar or something like that and you start drawing fish to that area trying to create the simulation of feeding right and so these guides you'd watch them pick this water apart because they're fishing and then you fish behind them with the fly and what's really cool is to me being a freshwater guy i was like musky pros man they always have multiple rods rigged and one of the reasons why is if you get a follow from a musky and he doesn't commit you have something called a throwback rod because right, that fish is engaged, he's active, he's he pursued it, he's looking for something, and you pitch a throwback bait, typically a completely different presentation, right back to where you moved to that fish, and oftentimes you catch him. And so that's basically what we're doing is that chopper would go down, disturb everything, get the fish kind of riled up and energized, and they're like, what's going on? And then boom, lands a six inch, you know, bulkhead deceiver or a glide flying weightless suspending fly completely silent like boom and they come up and t-bone it's like the coolest thing on the planet and it gave me a lot of confidence because i could see where they cast and cast right where they cast and you learn the structure from them so you're not just going down there guessing and they all speak portuguese and only portuguese so you that's like they're watching them fish overcomes the language barrier if that makes sense because you just imitate so i thought that was actually really cool so because you get to fish with each guide um, it's really cool because you have like moments with these dudes, right? Because we, we you can't communicate the normal way that people are going to communicate. And you're imitating, you're following them throughout the day and they're sitting there, you know, and it's like with Bagoji, I caught my big fish. And I, I mean, I stuck that fish like it was legit. It's this big chartreuse one. And I'm going to show you the footage because I want to narrate it. And so like you know, I cast out there, I start retrieving this, boom, I get a fish, cool. It's not that big. Now one of the things that's super important is that you don't just take that fish out of the water right away or horse him in if he's small because just like that chopper is trying to draw fish in, well those little fish are getting big fish stirred up and a lot of times you'll see a big fish flash right underneath them or he'll tail them, they'll be right next to each other. And the second fish is almost always bigger. So my boat partner, Paul, I'm trying to give him a shot at this big fish that I seen. In the video, I'm like, asu, asu, which is like the big blue-backed fins ones, like massive. This thing was like 12, 13 pounds. And so I'm sitting there just yelling, trying to keep my fish in the water, playing them, playing them. I gave Paul like six or seven casts at this thing, nothing, okay. I get that fish in, unhook him, let him go, clean up my fly. Super important. One, I always fish with a comb. You need a comb because flies follow. That's what happens when you got a lot of flash and synthetics and stuff. Comb it out because that next cast, super important. That's your presentation, man. If you if your flies followed, you ruined it. And this fish ate that following cast. I cast it back to the exact structure that I moved the small one from, and the big one, I assumed, came out after him, right? So they're holding on the same structure. This fly sinks down, 
literally, I, I don't know if it was the second strip or the third strip, but I'm just like, strip, strip, boom! And I'm just yelling grange, which means big, right? I'm just screaming grange. This fish is like, line is ripping out of my hands. I got both my hands as tight as I can go, and it's just peeling out and peeling out. He comes straight under the boat, and it's literally, my Legend Elite is just like, wham, all the way to the floor, and Bagoji's just staring at me like, <laughs> like what the hell are we gonna do we end up landing the fish right and so like I had that moment with Bogoji and of course he gets to go back and tell all the guides Gunner doesn't suck as bad as you guys think he does <laughs> No, but like you know, the first day I fished with Antonio and I couldn't strip set to save my life So Antonio's like what are we dealing with here? But at least I can kind of cast once in a while. I'll get a lucky cast in there So he got to see some of that and then with Rodrigo, I fished with Rodrigo twice, which was kind of fun because it was like the second day and like the fifth day. And so the second day, I was really focused on my strip set and trying to get the timing right and figure out, you know, the muscle memory and everything like this. And so I was far more concerned about getting my strip set right than I was catching fish because that impacts the rest of my trip, if that makes sense. So he's sitting there, he's like, get your tip lower. And he's like trying to point at stuff and he's all frustrated with me because I keep missing fish. And by day five, what was, absolutely fantastic is me and David we pull into this lake and we, we come out of this channel there's a huge drop back off to the right and a little cut like a five foot cut between the trees so there's like a row of mangrove looking things a little gap like five feet wide about two feet cut back and then more mangrove looking trees well those little cuts that's where those big fish are and that's where at least where they were all week right and I bomb like a 65 foot cast out there Fly lands dead center of that cut, like a foot from the bank. I let it sink down just a little bit because they were on the, the drop flies. We were fishing a lot of stuff with cone heads to get it down right quick. Literally, first strip it was like strip, boom! And I strip set into this thing. I start yelling grange because line is literally peeling out of my hands. And you literally just see my fly line like and he breaks me off. And what was funny is Rodrigo got to see me have like one of my meltdowns, which is just like are you kidding me and I like just like collapse on the boat like I'm about to cry like I just lost who knows you know a 15 pound peacock bass is like textbook Ugh. so these moments you get to have these kind of real moments with these dudes and it's just wicked cool because by the end of the trip I mean you just you kind of everybody's like family like it's not like he's your guide anymore but it's like they're your friends amigos man it's, it's a wicked cool thing to share those really real moments with somebody that you've never fished with before. So I'm just, I wanna share some pictures. Obviously this is kinda of like my big fish files. Um, some cool experiences. On the first night, oh, this first night was sweet. Unfortunately my boat, pipe, uh, my boat partner, <coughs> Michael, caught all the big fish that day. <laughs> but uh, this was another funny moment that I had with An Antonio. So. I really wanted to catch a black piranha, like really wanted to catch one. And I'm fishing my glide fly, which is like a seven inch fly. And we kind of moved out to the main river and we were fishing a big rock shelf, really cool looking rock shelf. Like it was like, to me, it was, I was fishing streamers like I would for brown trout on the Madison, but it was just a couple thousand miles away. <laughs> it was wicked cool. But anyway, we're fishing this rock shelf and Michael sticks a nice, like maybe an, a seven pounder or a six pounder. And of course, I'm just kind of like, come on, man, you got to share the love once in a while. And boom, like that next cast or something, I stick this black piranha. And of course, the thing's like the size of a dinner plate. Like it's like perfectly round. And so when you get that thing in that main current, man, my, I was like peeling drag. My line was doubled over. I was, I was like, here's my giant. Like, here we go. And this is on day one. And of course we net it and it's just just like a three and a half four pound black piranha and i am ecstatic like i could not have been happier i it was the coolest thing i've ever seen in my life and of course antonio's like that's not a big peacock <laughs> you know what i mean like he's just looking at me like get super pumped about this fish and he thinks it's like it's a black piranha why are you excited I wanted to share that but that's that's one of those fish pictures that's wicked cool and what was interesting, you rarely catch them, but you would occasionally get a piranha. And this is what they do to a slow jig clouser. <laughs> Literally, it just looks like scissors. Cut that tail off. But anyway, I want to talk about flies real quick, because I had a lot of success on a lot of different stuff. Um, I fished Fuzz Juniors, 
Got fish, jerk juniors, got fish, slow jig clousers, fish, imposters, yep. Body tubing bulkheads, yep. Obviously the glide fly, yep. Bulkheads, jig bulkheads. I tied just a big, like wicked, like it was like a nine inch yellow looking deceiver thing. Got fish on that. Um, I caught a fish on a lot of stuff. But for the most part, it was kind of like a five inch fly game, like four and a half, five inch, a lot of times white chartreuse over white, um, fishing a lot of saltwater hooks, man, that, I mean, those fish are hard on flies. You're fishing a lot of four aught, triple thick X, you know, nickel plated saltwater stuff, which is what all those saltwater, or all the, the bulkhead deceivers and the deceiver and the jig bulkhead and all that stuff, that's what it's all designed for, right? And so that was really cool. And I had someone ask, um, we fished 30 pound, just straight 30 pound mono. Some people would fish 40. We had <laughs> uh, Mike would, I think he broke off on 50 one day and he switched up to 60 the next. But it's not, it's not the breaking strength that you're worried about, it's the abrasion resistance. Because these fish are so tight to cover, they're in such thick trees, just knotted mess of trees that, you know, I think the, the fly line, I don't know if the Rio Jungle line has a 50 pound breaking strength, I don't know if they upped it, but most fly lines are about 30, 35 pound breaking strength. And he was, you know, like, wouldn't you break your fly line? It's not like a straight pull, it's not like you've got a snag and you're trying to get this thing out, it's just those fish eat, and if they're a big fish, you can't get them, you, I'm oh, sorry, <laughs> my, my dog's sleeping down there. You physically can't, you know, they can move laterally from you even if you have them pinned. They can still move side to side. So if they eat and then take you into timber, you need the abrasion resistance to be able to pull that fish out of that timber as fast as you can. So you're talking about sticking, you know, 13 pound bass and horsing him in as hard as you can. Like that's the name of the game because these fish are a foot from trees. They're in the trees. I mean, their name, Tucanare, means fish of the trees. So that's why you fish such a heavy leader and it's not tapered and i almost don't fish tapered leaders anyway ever it's just like two and a half feet three feet because i was fishing a sink three so it's kind of shorter because you're letting the line bring the fly down but like two and a half three feet of 30 pound salt water tip it that's it <clears throat> you can fish heavier you can fish lighter obviously all the glide flies and stuff are designed with the the nylon coated stainless steel leader to maximize movement but you still have that abrasion resistance they're not going to break wire off on a tree limb pretty cool plus the wire is coffee colored and it's stained down there so they can't see it anyway but anyway it's definitely a nine weight up game I brought an eight weight I fished it the first day for about four hours maybe three and a half hours and I I mean I was super impressed I'd catch these like three pound fish or these two and a half pound fish, man. These fish fight like saltwater fish. I mean, that eight weight was doubled over. And it wasn't that, that wasn't fun, because it was. And you'll get into schools of, of um, what are the butterfly peacocks, which typically are only about two pounds or so. And you know, you'd just have a riot fishing and catching fish on an eight weight. But I wasn't there to have a riot, I was there to stick a pig. And if you would have stuck, say a 10 pound bass or 12 or 14 or 15 pound bass on that eight weight, you would have been absolutely helpless, completely helpless. So I fished a 10 weight basically after that day for the whole trip. So it's definitely just a big rod game. What's, I fished a, a 10 weight Legend Elite from St. Croix. And what's, what's really nice is, I mean that rod just has a ton of feel. Ton of feel, ton of sensitivity. It's super awesome to cast that rod with Rio's jungle line. Just that shooting head tapered load so nice. And you really want to be practiced at that. I mean, you're going down there to fish for six days straight and catch some of the most aggressive fish that you might catch in your life. It's like, if, if you're coming from a trout background, you know, a five weight rod and double taper lines and you go straight to a 10 weight with a shooting head, you should practice that because <laughs> it's not the same. <laughs> I just throw that one out there. So I think what I want to leave you guys with is kind of the impression that you go home with because most people go there for the fishing and that's that's cool but you don't come back for the fishing if that makes sense well i think you probably do you probably will but you come back for the people which is kind of a, a different thing but i kind of shared like you have these experiences with these guides and it's it, it becomes a lot more than he's just a fishing guide but it's like this kind of brotherhood bond of i watched you strip set and get broke off <laughs> I don't know how else to explain it, but I I can't say enough about nomadic waters. 
and the operation and how they treat their crew. Um, because it's it's a family experience. Like, and, and I don't mean like everyone's there with their kids, but I mean like they welcome you into their family. Like Nomadic Waters exists in Brazil as a family. That's kind of what it feels like. And you get to come in and kind of be a part of that. And when you leave, man, that's like those relationships and those people. Like if I go back, then I cannot wait to fish with Rodrigo again because it's going to be night and day different. And all, I'm going to forget, oh, I forget what you say when your fly gets followed, but there's all these, you have all these kind of just memories and experiences with one another that get brought back up and it's, it's going to be a lot of fun to go back and see those guys again. They just, I mean, they treat them with respect. I mean, they are, they, it's their water. It's their communities, it's their livelihood. You don't just go there and take advantage of it and then leave and try to make a quick buck. But Nomadic Waters is invested in these people in the communities and giving them clean water and, and trying to help make a living and support families. And it's just a really cool thing to be a part of because it, it's, it's really cool. And it, it leaves with you, which I think is just, it's, uh, it's a pretty awesome lasting impression uh, to have. So. Thanks for watching this video. I'm sure it's just long-winded and me talking. Um, I might end with some fishing clips here. I might not, depends on if I can find some really good ones. But I might end with some fishing clips for you guys. Um, and if you ever get a chance, I don't think there's better people to support. So make sure you check them out. Do your homework. They'll put you on the fish. Thanks for watching. See ya. That's a big fish down there. There is. Oh, Grange, Grange, Grange. Aye! Yeah, baby! I'll cheer all the more. Yeah! Oh, there he is! Ooh! Oh, he's off, and my fly's gone. Now, what kind is that? The camera? <laughs> no. The <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a big paka. Paka, paka asu. Paka asu. Yeah. Okay. Bye bye. He's <laughs> just... I'm just breathing in. That's kind of a cool picture there. He's coming back for revenge. Paru, <laughs> Paru. <laughs> It's my pet. He just came back. He likes him. <laughs> Amigo. <laughs> Look at the blue. Asu! Asu! <laughs> Look at the blue on the tips of the. Oh, I can't even talk on the dorsal. Look at the blue. Wow. Dude, that's the shot you need. Woohoo! Oh, foi eu que peguei. Oh, he's got some kick in him. See a bump on his head? Yep. Big horny male. That big game male, man. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs>